Uh, I think they just put in extras. Yeah, I think so. That's to make y'all comfortable. <laughs> it doesn't make me comfortable. Well, it, it makes me frustrated. It does. But that's why I got a program. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, but then, you know, humility is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> you know. All right, guys. So, uh, Feel where I'm sitting yeah, I'm comfortable. There? No, I'm comfortable. Yeah, okay, whatever, wherever you decide. Yeah. So um, we're just sitting down to talk, and I think there was probably a day where we talked more to each other, where people, um, if there were, I don't know, there may be a little bit more curiosity, um, and I, when I met you guys and I found out you guys were friends, I wanted to, you have completely separate, different backgrounds. In today's world right now, there's, the world is sort of on fire. You know, the, 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 we have a president that has sort of inflamed racism, has, uh, people are just kind of like going to the opposite corners. And I watch you two, and I'm sitting there going, maybe there's something for all of us just to hear you guys you know, first of all, let's just take it one, one at a time. Uh, Chip, let's start with you. Who are you, and uh, and where are you from, and and tell me your upbringing. What was it like? What does it look like? Uh huh. Um. Right now, I'm uh, 63. I grew up in Minnesota. Uh, when I was a little kid, I was up on the uh, Minnesota North Dakota border. Um, very, very cold, but I didn't know that as a little kid. My mom would dress us up like the Michelin Man and uh, send us outside and, you know, we'd play all day. Um, I didn't know if we were rich or poor or anything. We seemed like everybody around us. Now looking back, I think we were kind of normal, maybe, maybe not quite middle class, but trying to be middle class. I uh, grew up with a father who would take off, uh, he was a traveling salesman in North Dakota, which was a tough job, sold thread, and he would take off on uh, Monday morning, come back on Friday night, so my mom kind of raised us during the week, and uh, our par my parents were active in, in raising us. I grew up in Minnesota till I was, uh, and went to school, went to college there. Uh, didn't move to Chicago till 1987, and have been in Evanston ever since that. Was it expected? <clears throat> was it expected for you to go to college? Was it a part of what everyone did in your neighborhood? Yeah. What did your neighborhood look like? Um, what did it feel like? Uh, the neighborhood I grew up in felt like tons of kids. Just, uh, you know, that's what I cared about and paid attention to. Lots of kids um, to play with, and uh, the house I grew up in was pretty much like everybody else's house. I come from a family with three kids, and my brother and I shared a bedroom. It was three bedroom, one bath house with a living room and a kitchen. That's, I mean, we thought it was, you know, just a just a very normal house. Um, as far as college is concerned, it seems like for as long as I can remember, that was. You know what was it? Okay, I may be out of space, which is why it's doing that. Okay, there was not really a uh, a time I remember not thinking I would go to college. I would get some Christmas money, and I would set aside. I was supposed to set aside some of it to save for college. So. Well, you know, when I was eight, I was saving for college. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, you know, I probably saved enough to pay for one book, but the idea was there. Did the word safety ever come up in your life as a kid? What, what, what did you, what, how did you play in the streets, and how did you, in the neighborhood, and was it ever, uh, like, in your consciousness, safety? Um... <laughs> Not except for from TV shows, you know, the things I was scared of were, were made up, monsters under the bed, um, 
the scariest thing I think we got warned against was getting in a car with strangers. I remember one time I was probably uh, 11 and a car pulled up to me and stopped and yelled out and I started running away as fast as I could. Turned out my dad had gotten a new car. <laughs> but I remember the message to run away from strangers. Um, but as far as um, feeling like I was in danger or anything, I really felt none of that. I would get to, you know, even as young as first grade, walk a mile or ride my bike to school and, you know, that was just, that felt totally safe. What did the, what was the cultural makeup? What was the ethnic makeup of your neighborhood? Uh, it was pretty much all, you know, yeah, anybody that's been to Minnesota knows the phrase Minnesota nice. <laughs> it was like so homogeneous I can't believe it now. I didn't know any black people. Uh, <laughs> <I> didn't, <laughs> not no, not one. Uh, I, uh, the only, the only black people I knew, like, was when I started, or knew about was when I started following baseball. And there oh, were black, wow. black okay. baseball players. And then, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think Moorhead, Minnesota had very many black people. But if we thought of people who were different than us, it might be that they weren't Lutheran or something. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, it just never occurred to. Uh, so when I hear like Lake Wobegon, does that yeah does that ring true for your world? That is that is kind of true. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Keith, um, tell me who are you and uh, where do you come from? Uh, my name is Keith. I'm 56. Finna be 57 in a couple weeks, and um, I come from the west side of Chicago. Uh, I grew up in a domestic violence type of thing. My mom was a, a teasing blues user. You, you know, back then in the 60s, everybody used acid, teasing blues, weed, and everything. And I grew up in that culture. And my uh, dad was a, um, he owned the junkyard, you, you, you know, and uh, I would go there and watch him make money and but I would sit in the car and drive like I was dr actually driving a car, you know, because I watched his feet power. I watched how he uh, drove the car with his feet, and uh, that's how I learned how to drive a car. I've never been to school for it. <laughs> 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 you know, I never went to driver's aid. <laughs> but uh, that's how I learned. But I grew up in a domestic violence. Uh, my father was a... Uh, did you know that when you were a kid, though? Yeah, I knew. You knew it immediately. Yeah, I. I How old were you when you realized it was a violent place? Uh, I was like nine. You know, kids grab. I grabbed the fast uh, because not only that, at nine I was in the in the streets too. It, it, you know, like hustling, shooting dice, <laughs> playing pool because we never had anything. Reason why is my mama was an addict. And my dad was a gambler. Back in the 60s, they used to, on the west side, everybody that owned the junkyard, it used to be a gambling house where they played uh, poker. You, you, you know, and police would be there, he'll be there, a lot of people, junkyard people, white people would be there. That's how I learned about culture is, uh, that and sitting in the car watching my father sell stuff to people, Mexican, Puerto Ricans, and I'll be standing there and I'll be waving and saying hi. And, you know, they'll bring me something because they always see me there. And then they'll, my father will leave the junkyard and I'll jump in the car, start driving up and down to Greece and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they'll come in, i sell some, keep the money. <laughs> it was at nine years old, at nine to 10, that's what I was doing. Because uh, we never had anything. Um, I learned very early that uh, being 
are from a family of domestic violence and drug use that I was on my own because it was a lot of turmoil. So I had to learn pretty quick. You know, I had to uh, learn. So one day my father came home. He wasn't drunk or anything because he didn't smoke cigarettes. He didn't drink. And my mom was at home. It was like a couple of weeks before Thanksgiving. And uh, he came home and he started that stuff. You know, my mom was drinking a little liquor. She wasn't high, but she was drunk. You know, drunk, cooking food. And uh, he came home and started beating on her. But little did he know, she found the pistol and killed him. And uh, I was living in the Henry Hornet projects at the time. <laughs> so uh, one day, uh, just to remind you, one day me and Chip and Mary Kay drove over there. <laughs> and this is really funny. I heard the locks on Chip car go, ch -ch. <laughs> to me, I, so I, had, I had never been in any uh, in any neighborhood like that, and to me, it all looked scary. But to Keith, it didn't. <laughs> right. To Keith, there were parts that didn't look scary, and then we'd go to another part, and he said, "This part, this part, you don't want to slow down." <laughs> <laughs> he, he knew, and he said, "Those two guys over there are my, my cousins. You don't, you don't want to go near those guys." <laughs> yeah, but uh, I grew up on the west side, and and after my father got killed, uh, we had to move. And from that point on, we was living in abandoned buildings on the west side of Chicago, and it was still everything was still the same. But then the world started to change. It was no longer, almost no longer in the 60s. And people weren't wearing high heels and checker pants no more. It started to get a little serious. And pretty quickly, uh, I had to learn how to babysit. My mom left us in the abandoned buildings for days with rats and everything. So uh, I had to learn pretty quick how to get out there and steal because I had... Four, I had a little brother and, and four sisters in our abandoned building with us. And I had to ask my sister that's close to me to babysit where I go to, it used to be called Buddy Bears. And I and it was uh, it was right there on Pulaski and Currents, they changed it's super super giant or something now. But I used to go in there, man, and steal everything I can to feed my sister and them. And, but I had a friend, uh, his name was Sylvester, and um, me and him was really, really hustlers, you know. We hustled together, uh, we smoked weed together. Only thing we didn't do was share women together. <laughs> but we used to go skating, I mean stepping. Back in the days it was stepping and Hot Wheels and Hamlin House over there around our Madison, the baddest part of the West Side. That's why I continued growing up in the abandoned buildings. And um, one day uh, he talked to us about, he talked to me, he said, man, your family could come in, our, in my cousin's basement. But at the same time, we had a DCF worker named Rochelle Woods. i never forget looking for us. And I didn't know this and uh, she, my sister then was down in the basement and I was hustling out there. And all of a sudden she uh, drove up on me. She said, where your sister and I'm at? And you, you know, I let, I took her over there to the basement. She grabbed him and I was the last person because she had to get them straight. So I had to keep doing what I was doing, you know, uh, going to, I was uh, going to police station at 11 and 10 and, you know, they, they couldn't put me in jail. I didn't have no parent to come get me, so I would shoot out the gate at the police station. <laughs> yeah, because I knew how to stay and leave the gate because, you know, it used to be behind the police station they put juveniles in there. And as soon as they leave the crack of that door open, man, I mm. shoot up out of there. And um, <laughs> had them looking for me, I didn't care because, uh, not only uh, was I smoking weed, I started uh, snorting cocaine at, at 12 because it, 
it was it was called pony packs back in the day, and that was the thing to do. Either you snort it, you know. Heroin wasn't out because heroin was teasing blues then, but I used I started using cocaine and snorting cocaine and smoking weed and drinking. I mean, it was a really it was something that that's all I knew how to do. You know, that's all I knew how to do. I, I didn't know, I wasn't, I, you know, I actually wasn't taught some things a, a mother should teach a son. I had to learn pretty quick on the streets that uh, things happen, you, you know, uh, how to fight, you, you know, how, how to steal, how to pickpock people on the trains, <laughs> you know. I had to learn pretty quick because that was the only way for me to get money. If it took going to jail, it did. And as I grew up, man, I've been to the penitentiary like uh, five times, six times I've been to different penitentiaries. Uh, my bit's been three years, six years, and seven years, every time. And, uh, the, and uh, you know, uh, the last time I went to prison, uh, I was in uptown <laughs> because you, you know I at 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 thirteen they used to have these transfers on a bus. It used to be called super dupus. You could ride all day on Sundays, <laughs> you know, and that's how I learned how to get around Chicago. I, I've been new about Evanston because before my mom killed my father, we was living in the projects and uh, actually we used to, as kids, we used to come up to Evanston and steal people bikes. And you know, they'd leave them on the side of the house, you know, so. And we would ride all the way from Evanston all the way back to the Henry Hornets down western. <laughs> you know, we used to come, that's how I got bikes. You know, uh, we used to come up here and steal them. And, and and that's all I knew how to do, you, you know, was to take. So you can sort of see why I'm sitting down with you to hear. Yeah, I understand. You, know, you, you look at these two lives and where you both, we both, we're all born into where we're born into. Right. We don't have that choice. Right. Right. You were born into, to, to, you know, Minnesota and you were born into the West Side. Yeah. And we do what we do. And, yeah. Um, I, you guys came together. I don't know how a couple of years ago. Yeah. And, what? Um, tell, tell Probably me, five. Yeah, tell about, me about that. Whatever you feel like sharing, and uh, um, you know, I, I think it's. Um, I love watching your relationship. I think it's beautiful and and unusual, and and something that I feel like. What do you? Uh, what I kind of want to know is what do you guys really think about each other, right? And based off of what I just heard from you, like, what, what do you really think about each other? What have you learned from each other that you're like, man, I probably, you sound like you've had more relationships with white people than you have with white <laughs> yeah. people. But, but, but like, what have you learned from each other? And, and, and just, just, let's just talk uh, about it. So, uh, so the thing is, uh, I used to, I go to, uh, I started going to these spirituality meetings uh, when I got out of prison. Because the last time I was in prison, uh, I went to this minimum pretty prison in East St. Louis. But I, I should have been in Max. You, you know, I thought maybe it was a blessing to be there. Cause I was in these dorms, I wasn't locked up in a cell and uh, so it was a drug and alcohol program for me and but I wound up going to spirituality meetings in that program. And um they said that if you sit down if you come and sit down in these chairs, I could we could teach you how to be a part of the community then a destroyer of the community, because y'all, just you destroying people's property. You, this is a time for change, and I sat in there, and um, since I was already connected with different type of people, I always, you know, I, it never came down to judgment on somebody, because, man, I steal from anybody. <laughs> 
You, you, you know, I stole from my mom. I steal from anybody. I don't care what color you are. Uh, if I could talk to you for five minutes, I know I'm gonna get a couple of dollars about you to go get high or uh, whatever. That's that's how I was on the streets. So uh, when I came home this time, uh, I started. I used to walk from downtown to Everston because I didn't have money. And I started going to these spirituality me because. You know, that's what I was doing in prison. And uh, and one day I, I ran across Chip uh, just sitting down talking and, and he was having coffee and we started talking and we was just talking and all of a sudden, you, you know, I felt connected. It, you know, I felt connected to him because, you know, uh, he had this story about his spirituality that maybe could boost me up, maybe could, you know, help me understand it more better. And uh, and we've been friends ever since, and it's a it's a good relationship to be connected to him because uh, he understands things. The spirituality thing is. <laughs> You could work spiritual. We I found out that through him I could work spirituality in many different ways, and, and you know, and uh, it makes me comfortable to talk to him, to call him sometime, to get guidance from him because you know I still have uh, part of the streets in me. You, you know, they ain't going nowhere. You, you know. Uh, because of the world today, uh, it makes me uh, draw more closer to him than it is being separated because of what's going on there. And we've been friends before this even started. So it, it, don't, it don't bother me to call him up and say, man, I'm having this issue. And, can we talk? Can, would you give me some guidance? And he will, you know. We just keep that spirituality connection. And his wife is just as much a part of my life and than anybody else. She, than, than anybody else also. So, you, you, you know, um, I can really get guidance from him. And it's just, even though we come from two separate things, sometimes it could be funny. <laughs> it could be really, really funny, man, the way he come. And what I talk about make him like ball up his toes or something. <laughs> <laughs> when I start telling where I come from, <laughs> you know, but we had this connection. It's just awesome to have him in my life, have his spirituality thing, try to understand the spirituality in a way because Either way, we get guidance from one another, and that's. How long have you guys been connected? We've been connected about five, maybe six years. You, you know, I've been yeah about five or six years, and it's just been awesome, you, you know, to connect with him, to talk to him about things, some personal things, and even though he haven't been deep down in that, in stuff like that, and but. He could get me, but I learned this. It don't matter what color a person is or nothing. Because I used to always say, even if a person went to school, they can't teach me nothing about the streets. <laughs> and, you know, and I was wrong. I was totally wrong. And working with him in our spirituality, it made me realize that, man, I can learn from anybody. You know, if I can learn from him, I can learn from a student, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I'm at today, you, you know, we have a deep spiritual connection. And, and it really helps me because I, I, uh, I work with a lot of different people now. Uh, I work with uh, mixed people, I work with, uh, how can I say it? I work with people that are different. <laughs> you know, I work with them and I respect them and and, and my boss is different. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, you know, he, he and he's great. You, you know, um, I work with a, a good people. I work as, I work with Night Ministry and it's really teaching me some things, you, you know, uh, 
they hired me only because of this relationship with Chip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you know, I got in through, because of having this relationship with Chip, even though he come from a different size and I come from a side of, man, give me what you got. <laughs> he, you know, but it's not like that anymore. It's, I have a relationship that he really guides me in. And work, being with him, it just, it opens up, he helped me, it opens up a lot of doors for me to connect with other people. Chip, how about you? What, what um, do you remember first meeting uh, Keith and what was your experience? And then obviously an invitation was offered somewhere, so you had to accept that. And what was going through your mind? Uh, yeah, we met about five years ago, and I've talked about my background uh, so that, you know, obviously, uh, you know, my childhood did not expose me to people like Keith, and my life has turned out very successful. I've known a lot of black people in my life, but none of them grew up in the projects. None of them uh, spent time in penitentiary. Um, I didn't know anybody like Keith. Um, and when when he approached me and, you know, it started as kind of a mentor-mentee relationship, uh, I guess one of the first questions was, is, am I going to be able to tell him anything he can relate to? <laughs> am I going to be able to relate to any of the things he faces? Um, and Keith talked about spirituality a lot, and I've got to emphasize that too. And there's a quote that I just want to share here that I think really, you know, when I, early on, I kind of thought about spirituality and religion as the same thing. And now I think of them as two different things, but there's an author I really like called Brene Brown, and she says, spirituality is recognizing and celebrating that we are all inextricably connected to each other by a power greater than all of us, and that our connection to that power and to one another is grounded in love and compassion. Practicing spirituality brings a sense of perspective, meaning, and purpose to our lives. To me, that quote applies perfectly to our relationship. But I'd have to say that I've learned probably more from Keith than he's learned from me. Um, and the lessons I've learned have been such important and life-changing lessons. One of the things I've recognized and maybe I had a hint of this before you and I th met, is that when something goes well for me, and I think this is general human nature, when something goes well, I kind of think it's because something good I did. <laughs> you know, I take credit for it. When something goes badly, I think it's kind of because of things that weren't my fault. So, you know, my life mostly went well. And I thought that was mostly because of the choices I made and all the things I did. It took meeting Keith to recognize that if I had been in his situation, I would have made exactly the same choices that Keith did. And if he had been given the, the opportunities and all the benefits I had, he would have made the same choices I did. It's not about that. It's about a lot of things that are outside of our control that... Um, that our lives have taken the paths we have. And when we connect like that and realize the connection, we realize, first of all, a lot of similarities that I didn't think existed, much more similarities and differences. But I also get a much different perspective on what life is like for Keith. I've got a couple examples that come to mind. There was one time you were talking about uh, sitting in the park and uh, just kind of uh, taking it all in, looking how beautiful things were. And it was like 10.05. And 
turned out the park closed at 10. <laughs> and a policeman came up and wrote you a ticket for being yeah. in the park at 10.05. Mm -hmm. And I thought, there is no way a policeman would write me a ticket for being in the park at 10.05. And another time, you had pulled off, you were riding your bike, you had pulled off onto the sidewalk to go Got park it. Ticket. And you get another ticket for riding your bike on the sidewalk. Again, another thing that would not have happened to me. And I realized, you know, I've, I've helped you navigate some things in life. And as we've tried to navigate those things together, I've just realized how many obstacles get put up in front of you that I don't have to face. And the other thing I have to, I have to and why do you think that is? Why is that? I think, I think it's uh, systemic. I think the the system is uh, looking at Keith and saying, if he's in the park at five after ten, that's going to cause a big problem. If I'm in the park at five after ten, it's not. They don't know anything about each each of us. They just look at us and make that judgment call. And making that judgment call before you know anything, to me, that's the, def the definition of prejudging, prejudice. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention about Keith that I've just learned so much about is, you know, he talked about the fact that I've helped him. He also talked about the fact that he works for Night Ministries. There were a lot of organizations that were available to Keith to step up and help Keith. And once he started um, taking advantage of those opportunities to be helped, they really worked. There's a lot of people who want to see this, you know, see a person like Keith succeed um, and I want to help him. And Keith could have taken that help and succeeded and moved on and he did something different. All that help he got, he has volunteered now for those organizations to help the people who uh, come after him. He's absolutely the best example of kind of paying it back by paying it forward that I've ever seen. So you guys sort of met by, you know, through a, a you both were working on a, on a path. Um, there's a lot of people that would never you know, get over to to where you grew up or where you grew up, both sides, right? There's no way you were going over to like Will Met, you know, from 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 the West Side to go and just start a relationship. How how? I mean, when you th you guys have a unique situation, so I mean. You know, you know other people still on the west side who have no idea how she's sitting <laughs> Right, they don't. Right? They can't imagine the, the yeah. relationship and the friendships that you have. And the same is true with you. Uh, you know, um, you probably spent less time on the west side than <laughs> Keith has spent up here. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, think about your parents um, and, and just think about, like, how do we... How do we start to begin to address this on a bigger scale? How do we, because yours is a five years, we're talking five years, and it's probably gonna be another 15 or 20. Who knows, right? We can't predict the future, but the, the, cho the chances is pretty, it's gonna be a longer relationship yeah. based off of what I know. Um, how do we do this? How do we? So, so you, you know, for me, uh, uh, my spirituality and with Chip, uh, we we looking at the bigger picture of things. Uh, so you know what's going on. Does that stop us from doing what we're doing? No. Y you know uh, it doesn't. And what it does is is to help us build more relationships. Uh, not only through me, I didn't brought people over here to get stuff from Chips and Chip didn't be a relationship with them. 
you know, we'll grab stuff, people donate, you know, some some people from the spirituality, they know I'm a part of their donate stuff and I didn't bring people over here and they didn't blue chip mine and <laughs> to pick stuff up and I let them they talk that people introduce they self. So but what's going on and how this lasts is we have to go around certain things in this world for us to survive. You know, for me to stay connected to Chip and, and stay connected, I have to go around certain certain things because uh, it's happening, it's gonna always happen, but this last five years being a part, getting the help that I need, uh, flying to different states, speaking about my past, and you know, on airplanes for the first time, staying in hotels that other people paying for just to hear my story. That's all because of me having a relationship with Chip. Because I, I wouldn't know nothing about a plane. The man <laughs> taught me about a plane on the phone. <laughs> I'd never been in an airport unless I was still in that old hair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, stuff like that, and uh, it, it's awesome because, you know, as he teach me this, how our relationship build, I go around certain things and to keep our, but I'm always real when, when it comes down to how to deal with stuff. Because I, my first thing is hang up the phone on you, <laughs> walk away from you, say, Get out, man, it's over, you know. That's that gorilla that I, I'm trying to keep locked up. Because if I don't, and then everything I work for is gone. You, you know, and that comes with my attitude and what's going on. I just try to, you know, keep my spirituality true with him because I need help. He's learning. And uh, it's working because sometimes, yeah, it get it's, it gets really scary for me because I don't want to be incarcerated no more. It, it, you know, I don't want to be locked up no more. Uh, these people taught me how to be a part of the community, and that was with an open mind and an open heart. That's what it all came down to. And I, as I sit there in them chairs and I walked out and I met Chip when I was standing in a hotel full of bed bugs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, downtown after I got out of prison, I had, that's where I was staying at when I met Chip. And, um, you, you know, it, it was worth the walk all the way from Van Bruin and to Elston, <laughs> down the lake. It, it was worth the walk to, to get this, you know, uh, to get, a, to meet somebody totally different, you know, totally different, and it didn't matter the color, but when I talked to him, man, it's just our friendship just evolved. What's it like to be know, to, 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 to know that you're loved by somebody as a friend, as somebody, what's that like? Man, it, 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 it means so much to me. It means, it finally means that I'm, I could connect with somebody. It finally means that I have other people that do care. I have other people that I could call on, you know, um, uh, and it makes me, it makes life worth it. It, it. You know, all the organizations that I volunteer with, giving back to the same thing that I was out there living in, and, Going now, I'm going to abandoned buildings to save people. <laughs> Cause I work with a night ministry. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going out there talking to people, using dope and drugs, and telling them how to move forward. Cause I've been in a lot, a lot of situations, and I've been in a situation, and you know, I can only talk about my situation with them and get them a little hope and. As Chip work with me and it's a friendship and talk to me, it, it just make it worse. It make it work because, it, you know, it's no other way. It's no other thing to do but to work on everything. <laughs> it, it, you know. How about you, Chip? Well, I think, uh, you know, Keith has talked about this idea of going around stuff, and uh, at first I didn't 
I didn't catch his meaning on that. But what it means to me now is going around things instead of being stopped by things, instead of letting them be a barrier and letting that make you angry or letting that make be a barrier and letting them make you quit. He figures another way around. And, uh, you know, I think uh, that's another part of the lesson here. I get more frustrated sometimes for Keith than he gets <laughs> for himself. <laughs> you know, he's always saying, it is what it is, you know. <laughs> but I think um, what, you know, when I think about the change we can make, which is what I heard in your earlier question, I kind of agree with Keith that I have to make that change uh, on a one-to-one -one personal level. And frankly, I had to get past some fear and some skepticism, some uh, of my own prejudice, prejudicial beliefs that I would be taken advantage of. Um, and I can still be taken advantage of, but Keith can still be taken advantage of. That's not, uh, that's not a racial thing. That's a, that's a human thing. The question is not, not about that. It's, it's the risk I, I need to be willing to take for the change I want to see happen. How often do you talk to each other? How often do you communicate with each other? Man, we, communi you <laughs> we communicate anyway. This man could go in the jungle <laughs> and we still gonna communicate. <laughs> I mean, a deep, I, I watched him one time. He went somewhere, all of a sudden he had a monkey on his shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, this guy could go all the way in the jungle and we still connect. <laughs> it's, it's true. It's I, I, I feel like it's a, uh, <laughs> it's an unusual and it's a, uh, it's an unusual stretch if we go two days in a row of not connecting one way or the other. Yeah. Most mornings I'll wake up to a text from Keith or he'll wake up to, to a yeah. text from me. And we have just gotten very much in the habit of not letting anything sit there if we need to talk to one another. Yeah, and also, you know, it's like this. Uh, even though uh, we face, uh, I face racism towards me, you, you, you know, through Chip and me growing up and listening and having an open heart, it doesn't matter now to me if a person is, cause sometimes I can see it in them, I can watch it in them. Cause you know, I've been in the streets a long time, so I can read body movement and stuff. And I, I could back off when I see they a lot of fear in them and stuff like that. But then I know when they open to listen because of, I learned that by being in the streets at the Sting Man Chip House uh, to not be just men, but how to bag off and how to go around things and how to be open. Cause it's, it's been much more greater people than I didn't met with Chip out in Elveston. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, I started dealing with Hilda's, I started by Terry Hilda's, I started this, I started messing around since I met Chip and, and oh man, I've been to a lot of agencies and he been just a big part of my life dealing with a lot of agencies and, and it's been amazed because he'll go, wow, woo, uh, <laughs> good for you, uh, man, how you doing? And, uh, it's only because, you know, uh, I have somebody, people that really care and uh, it's amazing how we learn from each other. And uh, The uh, truth yeah. is we really need community, right? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, what I'm hearing here is we just need community. That's all we need. Period, right? And isn't that fair? I mean, that that is fair, and I think uh, you know we're hardwired to that. The uh, 
our, our, our caveman ancestors, the ones who banded together and cooperated with one another, survived to pass on their genes. The ones who thought they could go it alone, they're the ones that got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. It's still the truth. We need community. And by us being with each other, it builds community. Uh, it helps me do a lot of engagement with people. You know, engagement means building relationships with people, no matter who you are, and just talking to you. Just talking to you, whatever you want to talk about. And I'm all in for it. You, you, you know, if you ever want to connect, I'm all in for it. You, you know, I never turn down anything when it comes down to connection because this is who I am today. And I became who I am by meeting Chip and uh, his wife and family and coming to a Thanksgiving dinner. People inviting me to a Thanksgiving turkey bigger than me. <laughs> yeah, you know, sitting at a table with people I don't even know, <laughs> but I met and we talked and what a great relationship uh, it's been and I could I want to continue this because it just helps me grow and it helps my heart open up and it helps me deal cope with lives and communities, you know it does and and just because of. Uh, we had his connection. Do you see dysfunction in, in, in Chip's life? I mean, do you, have you seen, so you talked about kind of this world that you grew up in. Do you see the same dysfunction in quote unquote other people's, like in, in worlds that you're like, man, they're just as fucked up as I was. I see, I, I, see, a, I, I see a lot of it in Chip, uh, but and it, I, I never walked in his shoes. That's how I look at that. I never walked in his shoes. He never walked in my shoes. But he's messed up in, in a little bit. I can't say all the way, but he's messed up too. <laughs> 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 you know, man, we helping each other. You know, uh, you know, he's messed up. I'm, I'm, I'm fucked up. Excuse my language, <laughs> but he's, but. Uh, we trying to figure out how to get past that messed up. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we trying to figure that out because we are twisted people. That's, that's what tomorrow. That's why you'll be connecting tomorrow, <laughs> right. and the next day, and the next. So, yeah, yeah, so exactly that's, right. Uh, no, that's that's what that's what I need. You know, I know he twisted, mm -hmm. but he's helping me, and I'm twisted. I'm helping him. So. <laughs> Well, thank you both for yeah. any, any last thoughts you, you have as we sort of wind this up that you've been thinking about? I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, happy you did this, Patrick. Uh, yeah, you know, Keith and I have had hours and hours and hours talking to one another, but we've never talked to another person about our relationship like this. And I, for me, it was special. I don't know about for you, Keith. To me, uh, it was really special, even though I, I do a lot of newsletters, and I, this one here meant a lot to me. It, like, my heart right now is bleeding because I'm sitting here with people that really love me. Somebody has invited me into their house, you know, come and pick me up, take me to breakfast, and, I mean, talk to me, try to move me forward in the world of hate, in the world of dysfunctional. <laughs> but we still maintain it because of what's happening out there shouldn't be happening with us. And we want to share this with other people because maybe it'll open up doors for them. And that's what I'm, that's why I'm so glad you've done it. I don't care who watch it, because when they watch it, maybe it'll open up a door for them to connect with other people like myself, not to, yeah. get them, not to get them anything, but just to talk to them and um, just to connect, engage with them. Cause that's, <coughs> that's all they want. Everybody is not the same. Every black person is not the same. So maybe your next door neighbor you're never connected with, he might be black, connect with him. Or the one living down the street, the kids, wanna let your kids play with him the black kids because you know they only want a friendship and a lovely relationship with you. You know, uh, that's what me and Chip have. 
and I, I appreciate you doing it. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. Thank you.